Welcome to the, the sixth in this uh, lecture series of Understanding Anger. Um, this is the fourth of the philosophical perspectives. We did two more religious and poetic perspectives before that, and now we've been running through you know, the various ancient schools of philosophy. Um, this, by contrast to the other ones we've done, is what we can call a non-Socratic school. Um, and I'll talk about what that means in a few minutes. But it's one of the major schools of antiquity. Um, they also have the distinction of being taken as an opponent by pretty much every other school of antiquity. So I'm talking about the Epicureans. And they, um, you know, they ended up drawing fire from just about everybody, you could say. There's a handout if you, if you want it right there for you. Okay. Um, now, it's not as systematic a perspective on anger as the two that we looked at last, the last two sessions, the Aristotelian and the Stoic perspectives, We have, in part because we have more of their texts. We don't have an awful lot of Epicurus's writings. Um, but there's still you know, a larger philosophical perspective that's reflected in, I only have one handout for you this time, I'm, I'm a little bit you know, uh, underachieving compared to previous times, but um, they do have a, a systematic perspective. You know, it was a, a uh, philosophical school that thought about uh, things in, in, in you know, broad senses and tried to bring things together, and having a lot of opponents that they had to fight with all the time sharpened their perspective as well. Um, but they don't have an awful lot to say directly about anger until we get to one particular work. So as usual, what we'll do is about an hour of presentation, maybe a little longer if we go on some digressions, and then if we have time, we'll do a half hour of question and answer or open discussion. Um, so the main topics are the sources for understanding Epicurean philosophy. How do, how do we actually get at this stuff? There's a really interesting story there. Um, we'll, we'll do a sort of a general overview of Epicureanism as a philosophical school, so we'll talk about their history a bit and their, their doctrines. <clears throat> then we'll look at this guy, Epicurus. What did he actually have to say um, about anger and connected topics? Um, the two main things I'm interested in with him are the issue of divine anger, which he doesn't say an awful lot about, but is, is important for him. And then how does anger as an emotion fit into his moral theory? And then we'll look at three other thinkers, uh, or texts at least, that, that fit into the, you know, the Epicurean tradition. One is by a non-Epicurean, Cicero. We, we've encountered him before when we looked at Stoicism. Um, Cicero was an eclectic. He does have a lot of Epicureans doing some talking as, as dialogue partners in his uh, uh, pieces almost always as the guy who takes the fall, because Cicero hates the, the Epicureans. Uh, but he does represent them, and it's fortunate that he did, because otherwise we'd have lost even some of those doctrines. Um, Lucretius is, was a poet. He writes um, on the nature of things. Um, he's a Roman poet, really a contemporary with uh, Cicero. And then there's this guy, Philodemus, who was an actual Epicurean philosopher, also contemporary with these two guys, and he wrote a text on anger. Unfortunately, we don't have all of it, and I'll tell you the story of, of that in just a few minutes. <clears throat> so if we think about our sources for Epicurean philosophy, um, Epicurus was one of the most prolific authors of antiquity, and unfortunately, we possess just um, five or six pieces of, of his work if you count his last will and testament as, as a piece. Um, we have three letters, um, two of which have more to do with physics and natural philosophy, one of which has to do with moral topics. We have um, <clears throat> a piece called The Principal Doctrines, sometimes it's called The Sovereign Maxims in, in other translations, and that is um, 40 short passages. So it's sort of like Epic, Epictetus's Enchiridion, the handbook, you know, this is a popular thing back in ancient times, give a really short summary of, of stuff. And then we also have this, this Vatican Sayings, which is a longer text, um, 81 passages, discovered in a 14th century manuscript in the Vatican Library, um, some, you know, quite a, quite a while ago. Um, that's a fortunate find, because if we didn't have that, we'd be missing a lot of stuff. But even still, it's pretty short. 
And then there's, you know, fragments occurring in other texts. People say, well, Epicurus said, you know, such and such, and thank God they put that in there, because otherwise we wouldn't have that passage. You know, Epicurus wrote at least as much as any other philosopher in antiquity. And that's all we possess. And one of the reasons why we possess what we do have is because this guy, Diogenes Laertes, who was a, um, you know, he wrote these lives of the philosophers. And he wasn't a very original thinker. He was just trying to, you know, present what people had said. Um, he copied out, word for word, these three letters and the principal doctrines and the will. And if he hadn't done that, we wouldn't have any of that stuff. We'd only know about Epicurus from, from legends. You know, the way that we know about um, Antisthenes or Diogenes the Cynic, we don't have any ancient Cynic texts. You know, that's all. They wrote stuff, and we just lost it, you know. So that's important stuff. Um, and then we've got this guy Philodemus of Gadara. Um, in the 18th century, they discovered his manuscripts in the ruins of a villa in um, Herculaneum, buried by the, the eruption of Vesuvius in 79 BC. So they found all these you know, big scrolls that had been you know, sort of shoved into like almost like cubby holes. That was one way you'd store them at the time. And when they started to unroll them, they began to disintegrate. So they realized, well, there's something here, but we can't do anything with it. Unfortunately, on anger was one of the scrolls that they managed to mess up that way. And unless we find another place that has some ancient scroll like that, which could happen, you know, we don't know what's in the first part of it. Um, they do have the technology now to, what they did in, 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 before to, to get what we do have was they would do this special process of trying to moisten it and then unroll it very slowly. And, and so, you know, that bore some dividends. Now they've got um, some computer technique, apparently, that can do some, you know, amazing imaging where you don't have to unroll the scroll. Mm -hmm. I, I have no idea how it works, but I'm happy because that means that we'll get access to text that we haven't seen for, you know, 2,000 years. Um, so that'll be pretty cool to see what, what's in those texts. But unfortunately, unless he had a duplicate copy of On Anger, you know, the first portion is lost. Um, Cicero, like I said, uh, was not an Epicurean. Cicero was what we call an eclectic philosopher. We had an interesting conversation about that last time, about, you know, is that a good thing or a bad thing, being eclectic. And so Cicero would, you know, eclectic means you pick out a bit of this and a bit of this and you bring it all together. He liked Aristotle and the Aristotelians. He liked the Stoics a lot. He liked the skeptics to a certain degree. He didn't like the Epicureans. So the Epicureans are almost always the people who speak first in his dialogues, because when you're the guy who talks first, you're usually going to be the guy who gets knocked, knocked down, right? <laughs> and so he has a couple dialogues where there's an Epicurean character. Um, and these are usually people who he knew in, in real life. In the book On Ends, the first two books concern the Epicurean school, and he's got this guy Torquatus as, as presenting it. Um, and it, it presents a more or less orthodox uh, Epicurean position. It may actually represent Epicurus's book lost to us on the end, on, on the, the, the purpose, you could say. Um, on the Nature of the Gods is another interesting dialogue, and he's got an Epicurean at the very beginning of that uh, who presents the Epicurean position and then doesn't say much through the rest of the dialogue. Um, we can also learn about the Epicurean doctrines and personalities, way of life, from sources that are not Epicurean. And when, when they're not Epicurean, they're usually hostile to the Epicureans. They're usually quoting uh, Epicurus or somebody else to say, look at how bad these guys are. Um, so some examples would be um, this guy Athenaeus. There's a book called that is translated as Sophists at Dinner. Um, it's the, the Deipnosophistae. Um, Deipnos is, is, is meal, and it portrays the Epicureans as ve being very harsh in conveying truth. Um, and there was also like a whole literature sort of presenting philosophers at dinner parties behaving very badly. If you ever read Lucian of Sam Sosta, he's a satirist, 
he'll have like you know a dinner party where all the members of the major philosophical schools are there, and um, come on in. I don't know where to sit. Um, maybe right there. Oh, okay. Um, there's a chair there. Yeah. There's another chair there too. So, you know, Epicureans. When we, when we, this is actually a good spot to talk about how the word has changed over time. When we use it in our culture, we usually think about people who are, you know, really what we now call foodies, right? They're they're into really fancy meals, the best wine. You should probably have some some good music playing at the same time. The kind of people who throw dinner parties, and um, that's not what it actually meant back then. Although they were accused quite often of being, um, you know, just lovers of pleasures of all sorts, the kind of people who just be partying all the time. Um, as it turns out, that's not the kind of life that they, they really advocated or lived. Um, they did think pleasure was the good, but it's a certain kind of pleasure, a refined kind of pleasure. So we, you know, we, we learn something about the Epicureans by looking at the negative portrayals of them. Because um, every once in a while they'll say, you know, here's what those guys actually said in this work, and, and, you know, we were fortunate to have those fragments. So as a major school of philosophy and antiquity, like I said before, it's a non-Socratic school. So it means it doesn't trace itself back to Socrates. Plato's school, of course, Plato's a student of Socrates, right? So that's a, Plato that's a Socratic school. Um, Aristotle's school is an offshoot of Plato's school, so it's got a lineage going back to Socrates. Um, the Stoics, you know, they are Socratic in, in a couple different lineages. There's, you know, they, they go back to the, the, the Cynics, um, who go back to Socrates through Antisthenes and also through this, this uh, Megarian school. Um, the Skeptic school, for the most part, takes place within Plato's Academy, and so that's Socratic as well. And, and all of these schools will base themselves in part by thinking of Socrates as the guy who represents philosophy. Epicurus, it's, it's, that's not a concern for them. Socrates is not a hero for them at all. Instead, um, they go back to this guy Democritus, this atomist philosopher, uh, who was a you know, materialist. He thought everything was atoms. Atom just means that which cannot be cut. Uh, comes from ah and then tmein, which means to cut in, in Greek. And... Um, Epicurus adopted some of his ideas and then developed a, a perspective of his own. He said that he was self-taught, and it may, in fact, be the case that he was. Um, a lot of other people who didn't like him said, no, no, he got his ideas from this guy or that guy, and they were second rate, so, you know, typical jealousy going on there. Now, he taught in a couple places. He taught in a place called uh, Mytilene, and he was asked politely to leave. Um, and then he taught in Lampsacus, where he, he got quite a few followers and friends. And then he wound up in, in Athens. And he was of, of Athenian citizenship, but he lived most of his life outside of Athens. His parents were, you know, em emigrants, right? That's, yeah. But they had Athenian citizenship. So when he's in Athens, he buys this garden. And you, you'll sometimes hear the Epicurean school is called the Garden, as opposed to the Stoa, or the Academy for Plato, or the Lyceum. Um, and he bought this garden, and he'd have all his friends come there, and they'd hang out and do philosophy and, and live together. And so that's where the school had its, its founding. Um, he devotes himself to teaching and writing and friendships. Um, he had a really good close friend, this guy Metrodorus of Lamsacus, who was an early popularizer of Epicurus's philosophy. Um, he would have been Epicurus's successor, but he dies before Epicurus, unfortunately. And he leaves a son behind, named Epicurus. You can tell how much he likes Epicurus, and a daughter, who are both provided for in Epicurus's will. Epicurus, his 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 will and testament says who is supposed to be supported by the garden and. It, it, it became something like a, um, I don't want to say cult in, in the negative sense, but you know where there's a very strong um, ethos behind it. They view themselves as, as kind of a, a separate society. Um, they're very close to each other, and there's a continuity to it going on. Uh, so it wasn't just a philosophical school. It was, it was like a whole society. Um, they even celebrated his, his birthday as um, 
like an annual event. Uh, Epicurus comes to be seen as a sort of savior figure to them over time. And then, you know, like, <clears throat> like the other schools, there's, you know, successors uh, in the garden. Um, they, they were usually called the successors, not the school arcs, as in the other ones. And the Epicureans spread out uh, as, as, as uh, Greek and Roman culture spread out throughout the, the Middle East and the entire Mediterranean. Um, so you find Epicureans in places like Alexandria. And Alexandria is a very important city. You know, we, we think about the library of Alexandria, but there was a library there in part because there was such a huge scholarly community. Um, so there's Epicureans there, there's Epicureans in Syria, there's Epicureans in, in Rome, um, and it becomes quite influential in Roman circles. So, you know, this guy Torquatus, uh, the character in Cicero's On Ends is, is a good example. It also influences medicine. There was an Epicurean um, doctor called um, Asclepiades of Bithynia, who is trying to develop Epicurean medicine uh, and bring it to Rome. And what we mean by Epicurean medicine was a different model of medicine than what the other people were working with, which actually was pretty... Um, pretty oriented towards looking at what we nowadays call mental illness and trying to th find remedies for, for dealing with that. Unfortunately, we don't really have anything. Uh, we have references to him, but we don't have his works. Um, Julius Caesar was, was viewed as being too, too receptive to the Epicureans. Um, when he was a young man, he came up on trial, and that was something that came out in the, in the trial, you know. Um, as opposed to like, you know, Cato, the Stoic, you know. Um, Epicureanism was kind of frowned upon. Poets were influenced, like Horace, uh, the guy Carpe Diem. Uh, that's seen as an Epicurean kind of sentiment. Um, so they become rivals and critics to the other schools. And what's interesting is with, you know, with the end of the ancient period, the Epicureans essentially disappear. Um, you know, we know that in the end of, of antiquity, uh, it's not just Christianity, but a lot of other religious concepts are, are floating out there. Um, people take a, a, a different attitude towards things. Epicureans just sort of like lose their following and also become seen as, as you know, very materialist and, and kind of retrobate and not really where philosophy is. In the Renaissance, there's, there's a revival of Epicureanism. So Renaissance philosophy, um, you're going to find people like Pierre Gassendi, who's a priest, by the way, um, who become Epicureans, and they, they adopt an Epicurean position and try to resuscitate it. And there are people today who, it's not like the neo-Stoic movement, I would say, there, but there are some people today who identify themselves as Epicureans. Um, I don't actually know any personally myself. I know a lot of people who identify themselves as Epicureans in the other sense, like they're foodies, you know, <laughs> the people over at the Culinary Institute of America, but I don't know any that are super into Epicurean philosophy. Uh, but I know they're out there. So, so what were the, the key things that these guys believed? Um, one thing is, like I said, they were materialists. They thought everything is material. Um, they believe that everything is a matter of atoms, and they're all sort of falling in the void. So there's two metaphysical principles, atoms and, and the void. And then um, to account for freedom, they said um, every once in a while an atom swerves. No explanation for why this happens, but you know it just happens once in a while, and that's what affords us freedom. That's why there's no determinism or fate the way a lot of people believe. Um, they also, <clears throat> they do believe in the gods, but they believe the gods are very different than how the poets portrayed them or some of the other schools of philosophy portrayed them. Um, the gods are not interested in human affairs because they're gods. Because to be a god means to be this blessed being who's enjoying, you know, this blissful state and it would just, you know, drag you down to get involved with the world and human affairs. So the gods are sort of like human beings that just have it really, really good. And, and you know, have, I guess, a gated community up in the heavens or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's a nice way. They don't let any of the riffraff in because the riffraff would, you know, distract <laughs> them. <laughs> so there's no sense praying to them because they're not going to, you know, they're not going to listen. And... You know, going to the temple, if you like going to the temple, that's fine, but don't tell all these stories about the things the gods do, because they, they don't really do anything other than enjoy themselves. And so this is a good, good 
you know, intro to their moral theory, they are what we call hedonists. Um, hedonists believe that the good is essentially pleasure. So there's a lot of varieties of this, and we'll talk about how Epicurus isn't just the party all night kind of variety. Um, but you know, hedonism, it's, it, there's a whole tradition of, of, of philosophical theories that say that pleasure is the good and pain is the evil. Um, and everything else, if it's good, it's good because it leads to pleasure or alleviates pain. And, and if it's bad, it's you know, the, the reverse. Um, now, they devoted a lot of attention to physics, to natural philosophy, uh, in, our, in, in part to have a, a, a pursuit that was enjoyable, because it's, you know, it's fun to sit around and speculate about stuff and try to work out doctrines if you're into that sort of thing. But they also did that because they wanted, Epicurus in particular, this is why he was seen as a savior figure, he wanted to free human beings of these fears about natural phenomena and the gods getting angry and taking you know, vengeance or, or you know, uh, being jealous of human beings. A lot of people at that time were living their lives in considerable fear. And so when there's you know, lightning, this is one of the things that they speculated quite about. What, what's, what's going on in lightning? Is it really Zeus you know, getting ready to punish somebody? Or is it just a purely natural phenomenon? <laughs> Sounds like today. Yeah, in many respects, the Epicureans are, are forerunners of um, some, of the, some of the modern atheist movements. What, no, I don't mean atheist movements. I mean the was there a big population of Epicureans then? Um, they... Well, that, that's a good question. So the garden itself, we don't know how many people lived there because only a few are named. But, you know, we can imagine that it, it was like a large household, you know. Um, so maybe, let's say we estimate it like 50 or 100 people in the garden, which is ongoing. And then there's people, you know, we might call them freelancers, you know, out in the, in the culture. Yeah. And so it's hard to say how many there were, but it was, you know, in the ancient world, um, for people who are looking so, for some sort of meaning to life, these these major philosoph philosophical schools were one of the big um, big alternatives. You know, religions provided another thing. You could also just like you know try to pursue you know rank, position, glory, that sort of thing. But a lot of people were into philosophy. There's there were probably a lot who were. Like you know, not that serious students who just like heard some of the message and they were like, "Yeah, it sounds great. I'm gonna drink." You know, <laughs> <laughs> let's have some dinner parties. You know, but but I think there were always quite a few um, who who really were trying to live an Epicurean life. But, what were you gonna say? Yeah, I was gonna say what I meant was like more in the fundamentalist religious type. You know, there the, were the floods because. People are being bad and you know, yeah. claiming, you know, this is because you're gay. Well, that's why we're having this. That's yeah. why we're you know, being punished, which it would be similar to what... Yeah, the Epicureans the were, were trying to dispel those kinds of fears. Because that was very, yeah, I mean, that was common to, to see natural phenomena as in some way oriented towards human beings as, you know, like, okay, there's an earthquake, Poseidon must be ticked off. You know, what did we do? You know, mm -hmm. um, it's probably that guy mm -hmm. over there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's what I mean. Certain schools of thought today are erupting, sort of going back in time, talking. Like well, that. I think that's always been around. That that notion of um, with being. Yeah, I mean, we can punished. find that in the American so, colonies, in in not just in Puritan mm -hmm. literature, but even in in uh, um, you know more widespread literature. And then we can find the day is saying, no, that's not how how things work. You know, and so there's that that same. Um, struggle is, is born out. Interestingly, Jefferson identified himself as an Epicurean. Um, I don't know exactly, I don't know his work well enough to know whether he was really an Orthodox Epicurean or, but he called himself one. So, yeah. so let's, um, let's go on a little bit. There's a couple other things I want to bring up about their doctrines before we get to anger. One of the, the points that Epicurus really stressed is about death. Um, you know, we have fears about natural phenomena and the gods, and you can dispel those by understanding how things work, but death is not something we can escape. He talks about, with respect to death, we're all cities without walls. Um, there's, no, there's no getting away from it. 
So maybe that should cause us anxiety and trouble. And Epicurus says, no, because here's, here's a sort of dilemma. Either you're not dead yet, in which case you don't need to worry about death because you're not dead yet. You're not experiencing it. Or you're dead. And what it means to be dead is there's no you. <laughs> so there's nothing around to actually suffer death. Death just means the, the end of, of your existence. So there's no point at all in being uh, concerned with it. And, you know, you might say, well, then why'd you write a will? You know, that's one of the retorts that some people do have. And Cicero actually has that in his odd ends, you know. But um, eh, he wanted to, you know, provide for his, his, his friends. Um, now, their goal in, in life was to have a state of what he called ataraxia, which means being untroubled. So it's, it's hedonism, it's, it's aiming at pleasure, but it's aiming at a kind of pleasure that is going to be, um, you know, uninterrupted and untroubled by pains, by fears. It's more of a, uh, a negative thing, although um, it's not, you know, it's sort of like, you know, when you get to lay down after a really rough day and you're, you're, you're you know, maybe your, your joints kind of hurt and stuff like that and you get in the bed and you just like lay down and now you're at rest, how good that feels. That's an example of ataraxia. Um, or when you've got all your bills paid for the month, you know, and there's actually still some money left in the account and you don't have any worries about, you know, what's going to happen or how you're going to pay, you know, this or that. Um, that's ataraxia. There's, there's a lot of other examples we could, we could give. So um, he will make a distinction between two types of pleasure. This, this is some of the stuff that I have in the handout for you, which you don't need to necessarily look at right now, but it's for future reference. He talked about um, moving or kinetic pleasures and static pleasures. So like laying in bed after a long day, that would be a static pleasure, right? Getting up and um, having a drink would be a moving pleasure. You're doing something. It's active. And Epicurus thought that um, the static pleasures are quite often a removal of pain or a removal of trouble. Um, they're, they're, you know, they're not an active getting some pleasure, doing something that will, will bring about pleasure. It's more a removal of pain. But he says that's more pleasurable. In, in the long run than just, you know, going out and doing active uh, things, you know, eating, drinking, um, having sex, um, going to a museum and running your eyes all over things, you know. Um, those, he, he thought, are less pleasurable in, in many respects. Um, he also made a distinction between pleasures and pains of the body and the mind. The body does feel pleasures and pains, uh, and, and when you talk about the mind, the mind is in the body. He thought it was like little, you know, even finer particles spread throughout the whole body. You know, the, his psychology probably doesn't, doesn't work for us today, right? Because we have a whole different theory of things. He'd probably nowadays say, well, it's that brain of yours, you know, that's doing things. He thought the, the center, a lot of ancients did, the center of uh, consciousness was here. Um, but, you know, not up here where we, we place it. The, the hedonism seemed to have that pleasure until they die. Like they, yeah. they're moving into death. Ideally you do, yeah. <laughs> yeah, ideally you would have like a life that's got no worries, no unnecessary pains, and then, you know, sort of a sprinkling here and there of active pleasures, but none that are going to cause you problems. So like, you know, you, you, have, you have a glass of wine with dinner, but you don't drink the whole bottle so you're not hung over the next day, right? Because that's a pain. Um, and... Uh, you, um, you know, you, you, you listen to some music, but you don't get yourself so wound up with music that you need to go to a concert and, you know, wait in line and, and be there with a whole bunch of other sweaty fans bumping around and stuff like that, right? So, yeah, it, it, the goal would be to have a life like that. Um, it may not be that realizable for some people. What were you going to say? Doesn't uh, uh, carpe diem, which I think means seize the day, yeah. imply uh, the uh, idea that you should try to enjoy what you can enjoy before it falls apart and yeah. you have to experience pain? I think a lot of people tend to interpret it as like, you know, um, 
party as hard as you can today because who knows what's going to happen tomorrow. But you're right. The original idea is that, that you find in Horace is we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So, you know, enjoy what you can. Um, now, so going back to physical and mental pleasures, um, Epicurus says one of the key things with mental pleasures that makes them uh, superior to physical pleasures is the factor of time. When you're feeling a physical, a bodily pleasure, you can only feel it in the present. Um, think about when you're eating something that you, you really enjoy eating, right? There's a couple different things that go on. One is that the first bite, the second bite, the third bite, those are the best. And by the time that you get to the end of the dish, it doesn't taste quite the same for a lot of dishes. Um, interestingly, like uh, Coke and Pepsi, remember when they used to do those taste tests? Um, they found that um, Pepsi would usually win if people just took a sip because Pepsi is sweeter. But if you had to drink a whole like little cup, like a Dixie cup of it, Coke would win. Coke has more, more bitterness, and the bitterness and sweetness are a little bit more balanced. Pepsi was viewed as too sweet over, over time. You know, um, but then you know. So let's say it's something else that you're eating, right? You, you eat it, and while you're eating it, that's great. But then it's gone, right? And so what do you do after that? You know, um, well, you eat some more. Yeah, and, and you can now you can remember the taste of it, but that's a mental pleasure. That's no longer your tongue actually doing something. That's you remembering it, and you can anticipate it. And that's another kind of pleasure as well, right? That's also mental pleasure. And the things that we enjoy through the mind, like, you know, for example, friendship. There's a lot of pleasures involved in friendship. Those aren't just bodily pleasures. Those are mental pleasures. You're, you're connected with that, that person. Is that, where's that sound coming from? Somebody's phone. Is that next door? I don't know. Maybe? Oh, okay. Well, we've got, we have a soundtrack then. <laughs> So that, that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, he also distinguishes between desires. He talks about desires that are natural and are necessary. That's one class. Desires that are, uh, wow, it's really getting up. Desires that are, are natural but not necessary and desires that are neither natural nor necessary. And the desires that are neither neither natural nor necessary, those are the ones that get us in trouble because they're based on what he calls groundless or vain or empty opinion. So, you know, he gives like, you know, a couple examples. The notion that um, you, should, you should eat something, a good idea, right? Um, the notion that you should just like eat and eat and eat and eat and eat as much as you possibly can, that's a baseless opinion. That's, that's, not, that's not a true opinion. Uh, it's not grounded in something, and it'll get you in trouble, especially if it's guiding your desires. And if you think about our, our culture, you know, what does advertising do? It, the whole purpose of advertising is to create desire where desire did not yet exist, or to awaken desire. And the way you do it is by creating beliefs and feelings in people's minds about, hey, this would be good for me, and I would enjoy this, and so Epicurus is, is kind of giving us a, a manual for how to avoid being taken in by what our culture is throwing at us. He says we need to restrict ourselves to the desires that are either natural and necessary, like you got to eat, you know, and you do have a desire to eat. Good, good that you do, because otherwise you're going to die, right? Uh, or somebody's going to have to force feed you. And then desires that are um, natural but not necessary, we, you know, we can follow those too. We just shouldn't make those the priority. We should restrict ourselves as much as possible to the desires that are natural and necessary. And natural you know, covers a, a, a wide ground for, for him. So this leads to um, this really famous saying of his. He says, a person cannot live pleasantly without living prudently, that is with practical wisdom, well, kalos in Greek, which could mean beautifully as well, and justly. So if you really want to have a hedonistic lifestyle, if you want to have full pleasure, you have to be prudent in it, you have to have a good way of life, and you have to be just. You have to uh, um, follow some rules. Yeah, go ahead. Well, explaining hedonism, hedonism yeah. like that... Uh, 
does, it sounds like a good thing. But yeah. the way I think we, the way it's evolved over time is that if you're, you're hedonistic, you're only thinking of yourself or your own yeah. pleasures and stuff like that's how I was raised to think about being that way. There was a but guy, uh, Aristippus, who, who predates Epicurus, who's a student of, of Socrates, who somehow got the message from Socrates that pleasure was the only good, and, and he was a hedonist like that. He said bodily pleasures are where it's at. Um, try to heap up as many of them as possible. You know, you want to structure your life so you're having one bodily pleasure after another. He got criticized for like hanging out with prostitutes, and he says, you know, why would I? Why would I marry? I mean, this is exactly what I want, right? I can get it as a business transaction. You know, yeah. that was sort of the hedonism that you're talking. I think that's what we picked up. From yeah. So I mean, there's always two different things, and the Epicureans were always being accused of being that kind of hedonist by other people. You know. But don't you have to be persistent in wanting this? I mean. Yeah. Epicurus you actually. You narrow yourself down to that goal. I mean, you don't yeah. have any. Interferences. Well, you you're going to have interferences. You just it's more like when you get off track, you got to make sure you come back on track, right? Um, just like when you let's say you're trying to have a, a healthy diet. Yeah. Most of us are going to fail at one time, yeah. right? like the holidays, right? Yeah. But then it's a question. You say, ah, screw it. You know, I've left the diet. I'm never going back to it. It's, there's no point. No, you you guide yourself back to it and say, okay, now I got to get back on track. Um, Epicurus actually says, unless we make sure um, to follow these, these, these doctrines, our, our desire is not going to match up with our way of life, you know, the, the way of life that we want to live. So you're, you're, you're entirely right. It's going to take some discipline and, and um, some application. Prudence is supposed to help us out with that. So prudence is practical wisdom. It's supposed to teach us like how to judge rightly between pleasures. Do I... Do I sleep in, even though I, need, I know I need to do some work, and work doesn't seem all that fun? Um, well, you know, the work needs to get done, and that will lead to greater pleasures later. That's behaving prudently. You know? I don't see any accountability as if you're a hedonist. You have no accountability but to yourself. Well, you could have accountability to, really. to others. It's, there's no inherent accountability to it, but if you have friends... Um, you know, Epicurus thought friendship was the greatest of, of pleasures. And you can't be a good friend if you're just like yeah, being you totally self-indulgent, you know. Um, even if you just see your friends as only a source of pleasures and not valued in, in, for their own sake, you're not going to be a good friend. Yeah. So you're right. For a lot of Epicureans at a low level, you're, there's probably not going to be accountability except to oneself. Um, but there's the possibility of that you know, if you have good friendships. He also does talk about justice, right? And so what he means by justice is um, not harming other people, not, not allowing yourself to be harmed. It's a kind of social contract that each society has about, you know, what, what's going to keep people from harming each other. And he, he says rather unconvincingly that um, you really should be just because if you're not, then you're always going to be worried about getting caught. And I know there's plenty of people who don't worry all about being caught, you know, uh, or don't care, you know. Uh, uh, but he, you know, he he tends to think that um, if you're being bad to people, um, you may get some temporary pleasure out of it, but it's not going to pay off in the long run, you know. As a matter of fact, he told he advocated. Don't get involved in politics at all because you're never going to be happy in politics. Yeah. Well, that was yeah, good I, point. I was just going to get that. I mean, the, isn't the context the people who had the uh, uh, the luxury to indulge in philosophy and so forth? Yeah, was of course the elite. Uh, well, by some sense, life was extremely precarious. Back yeah, then. the masses lived. You know the contrast yeah. between the average person. So it seems, in some ways, it's a very balanced approach for someone. Most of these people could do more or less what they wanted in, in some yeah. levels. It would have been, although you know, if you if you weren't a slave who was like you know totally without freedom because you had a bad master or something like that. Because quite a few slaves did have quite a 
quite a bit of freedom. Um, and you took on Epicurus's, uh, let's call it his system, right? You know, think about it sort of like the self-help systems that we see out there today, because that's, that's really what it's like. Um, it advocates living a very simple life. So you don't need a lot of money to do it. As a matter of fact, you, you don't want to be spending your time on trying to make a ton of money because the pleasures that you, you know, once you remove pain from, from the situation and worry and trouble, um, it, you just need some simple pleasures and they will take on, <clears throat> they'll take on a much greater um, value for you. He, you know, he, 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 he's the kind of guy who'd sit around and just eat a pot of cheese and he'd be like, you know, you could imagine him going to Hannaford and getting like a, a tin of, of cottage cheese and just sitting there and eating that and saying, this is really good. I'm an epicurean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or maybe a jar of pickles, you know. Um, so it's, it's, it's a lifestyle that would be possible for many people to live. Um, of course, if, if you are a slave, you're kind of, you're kind of screwed because you've got somebody who's going to make trouble for you, your master, right, or mistress. But for most of the, if, if you're living it the right way, it's doable for most people. If, if you're living it like the, you know, got to party all the time, that's very expensive. Well, know? not only that, if you, if you live like, well, you know, I love sex and I want to have it whenever I want. And if yeah. my friend's wife wants it, why, this is pleasure. You don't have any, if you don't add the other. Epicurus the other is not a, interesting, he was not a big fan of sex. He actually tells <laughs> a young man, <clears throat> you know, you can follow your sexual passion if you want. And try to do it as prudently as possible, but you're, if you think about it, you're, you're almost always going to cause trouble for yourself. And he like <laughs> lists a few different you know, things that it's likely to lead to. And we've all had, we've all had that mm -hmm. you know, message when we were uh, yeah. younger, and then probably a lot of us ignored it. And from experience, we can say, there's, you know, there's, there's something to that. You know? um, and he... he uh, yeah, he sees sex as something that is natural but not necessary. Um, now, you could say, well, what about the human race? Wouldn't it be nice to continue it? You know? And so then in that sense, it is, it is necessary. And um, he would say, like, most of the, the things that people call fetishes, totally unnecessary. Just setting people up for all sorts of problems, you know. Or like you know, or like you know, screwing around, right? <clears throat> Philandering. Um, he would say that's that's a recipe for disaster because you know, it think is. about how many ways you can you can get yourself in trouble with that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All that you're describing seems to be uh, cause and effect without any uh, moral uh, code. Uh, was there a moral dimension to his? Yeah. 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 Well. Yeah, the justice part is a moral dimension, and if you think that pleasure is the good, and it's good to live a pleasurable life, uh -huh. that is the moral code. Okay. So he, he lives prudently. So he was defining moral values in his terms. In, in terms of pleasure and pain, yeah. yeah. And, you know, we're going to see other theories do that later on down the line, like um, the whole utilitarian movement um, in, in mm -hmm. the 1900s does that sort of thing. So let's now talk about anger. Um, we haven't talked at all about how anger would be affected. He, <clears throat> he talks about the gods in anger um, at the very beginning of, of the Sovereign Maxims. He says, the gods are free from feeling anger or favoritism. Why? Because these would imply weakness on their part or a kind of vulnerability. Being, being able to get angry is in some respects a a lack of of um, you know freedom or a lack of perfection that, that the gods don't don't suffer but we unfortunately do that quote is going to get used by Epicureans when they have debates among themselves about the nature of anger um, so the upshot of this is we don't have to be worried about the gods getting angry with us which is very liberating isn't it we don't have to worry about divine wrath. Um, he also says that, you know, because of this, anger is a distinctively and, and you know, also animal emotion. It's not something that's like woven into the cosmos. So earthquakes, that's not anger. Uh, lightning, that's not anger. Nobody's angry at us. Bad things sometimes happen, but it's not the wrath of, of the gods. And in the Vatican sayings, he says, if parents have cause to be angry with their children, 
Of course, it's foolish to resist and thus not try to beg for forgiveness, try to mollify somebody. But if they do not have cause and are angry without reason, it's ridiculous to make an appeal to one who's irrationally opposed to hearing such an appeal and thus not to try to convince him by other means in the spirit of goodwill. So his point is, angry people, some you can deal with, some you can't. If they're irrationally angry, if they're angry based on groundless opinion, as we're going to see, mm-hmm. um, there's, no, there's no getting around that. You know, you might be able to, maybe you, take, you have them take a walk or you, you leave the situation. Um, yeah. Go ahead. When you have anger and you, you're able to get rid of it, vent it out, then you go back on track, don't you? Well, I mean, if you don't get rid of that anger that, that, that is gnawing away at you. It works that way for some people. Okay. That is, that is an idea about anger that moral theorists and psychologists have shown in, in the late 20th century is, is a recipe for disaster for many people. Because the, the idea was that you know, anger is sort of like hydraulics. You vent some of the fluid, and then you know, there's less tension. What a lot of the research has shown is that it doesn't, and that people will actually become angrier, and they'll develop habits of expressing their anger that way. <clears throat> so it's not always the best. For some people, it, it works. Um, for other people, it actually makes them worse. And it depends on the degree. Yeah, and if you add two, <clears throat> if you add two people in a situation where they're both angry at each other, and you let them vent at each other, then they get even angrier at each other sometimes. So, um, but you know, it's, for some people, it, it can work. Um, that idea of living pleasantly, you know, and free of pains and fears. Um, if we think about this idea of living prudently, well, and justly we can ask ourselves how compatible is this with feeling anger or acting on anger, having an angry disposition, or making other people angry. So if we think about it in terms of the living well, the kalos, um, or, or honorably or beautifully, anger is not very attractive. And so if, if our goal is to live pleasantly, and we're getting angry all the time, we're not living well, so we're not going to be living pleasantly. Um, If we think about it in terms of prudence, practical wisdom, anger seems to involve some pain and feeling of it, and it also has a a really strong tendency to lead us to to, um, thinking out courses of action which seem pleasant at first. I'm I'm going to show that that son of a bitch, you know, Um, but then they're going to lead to further pains. You know, we, we embarrass ourselves. We alienate other people from ourselves. We inflict too much um, damage. You know, we, we make stupid business decisions sometimes based on anger. You know, you can't. You know, you can't tell me what to do. I quit. You know, that, that sort of thing. People do that when they're angry, right? So that that may not be compatible with prudence. And then if we think about anger considered <clears throat> in terms of living justly, the point of justice for Epicurus is that moral dimension that. Marvin was asking about, is that we don't harm other people or or be harmed, that we follow the laws, we follow the the agreements, what's beneficial and what's useful. So we can ask, does anger serve a kind of social purpose? And and sometimes it it probably does. There's probably some people who need to be told off, right? But in a lot of cases, adding anger to the situation doesn't bring about more justice. At least that's the way Epicurus sees it. Now, another way that's useful to think about this is that distinction between kinds of desires. So, some states of anger would appear to involve either, they would appear to involve those desires that are neither necessary nor natural, that arise from empty opinions. Epicurus uh, and the Epicureans included revenge fantasies in this category. You know, when people um, get angry and they think about, how am I going to, how am I going to show that person? How am I going to embarrass them? Or how am I going to put them in their place? Um, Epicurus thinks that that's, that's a desire that is, is not going to serve you. Um, they will talk later on about natural anger. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. But he thinks that it's often based on groundless desires. So what would be an example of that? Um, I need to be listened to uh, by everybody uh, or people are not valuing me. So that's, that's a belief that some people have, um, but it's not one that's based in reality. 
you know. And but if you do have that belief, you're probably going to get angry pretty easy, aren't you? Because people aren't going to listen to you most of the time, and then you're going to have a cause to be <coughs> angry with them. And so it, this is a good example of, of um, unnecessary um, anger. So there's often a, a lack of natural limit with these empty opinions and, and their connected desires. Here's some examples. In the Vatican sayings, he says, poverty is great wealth <clears throat> if measured by the goals of nature, and wealth is abject poverty if not limited by the goals of nature. So you don't really need to have that much. And if, if you do have this, this you know, desire to just accumulate and accumulate and accumulate, anybody who gets in your way is going to make you angry. You know? Something's bothering me. There's mm -hmm. a lot of anger today. I mean, there's anger, like sure. just recently on, on TV, anger in the Walmart. There's yeah. anger in the parking spots. Yeah. Yes, just driving around. Yeah, yeah, what, yeah what, whatever. Yeah. The whatever. road rage thing, yeah. <laughs> Where are we in this? How, how do we? Well, how, Epicurus would say we're not good Epicureans. <laughs> what is the Epicurean? Epicureans would say, well, most people aren't Epicureans. You know, they're not good Epicureans, and that's that's <clears throat> at any given time, our culture is not one that's informed by philosophy very much. You know, they're offering this as sort of a remedy for for that sort of thing. And you're right. I mean, so the idea about road rage, right? First, you actually have to get on the road. Yeah. People get mad at each other in the parking lots. You know, uh, what do we call that? It's not even it's not even road rage yet. It's parking lot rage. You know, um, it's something deeper than that, though. I mean, if you use that as an excuse, there's something else. I well, I mean, that. so there, there's a natural human reaction of anger, right? But a lot of a lot of what feeds into it are our perspectives on things. So we get angry at people at times that we don't need to because we have um, mistaken beliefs about things. Like, you know, if you have the belief that everybody should be nice to you all the time, you're really setting yourself up for trouble, right? Um, yeah. Because that's, I don't know where people get that belief from, but it's, it's not one that's based on any sort of, any sort of uh, you know, rational basis that's, that's you know, provided to us by evidence. Um, I think a lot of times that's one of those cases where desire drives belief, which then drives desire, you know. Um, but there's, there's all sorts of things like this. And if, if we're in a culture that teaches us um, you're not somebody unless you have a lot of status or a lot of money or maybe celebrity um, and everybody's jostling with each other, that's a situation where people are going to get angry with each other. Oh, that's just it. We have... A one percent that have all of those things, and we have a, a larger, a larger society that desires those things. Or well, because they've been told they, they, they and because it, it gives them some kind of power. Yeah. They want they want a piece of the, the piece power. of the action, as they say. Yeah. yeah. Right. He's got a couple other interesting sayings like this too. <laughs> he says the stomach is not insatiable, as most people say. Instead, the opinion that the stomach needs unlimited filling is false. So, you know, this is something that people can get angry about as well. He says, the esteem of others is outside of our control. We must attend instead to healing ourselves. Um, and then he says, the ingratitude of the soul makes an animal greedy for endless variation in, in its way of life. If we, if we need to have options all the time and people are screwing us over if they don't give us lots and lots of options, you know, um, we're going to get angry very easily. Um, so anger, you know, is not going to be part of an Epicurean life. It's not going to be, it's not that it, you'll never get angry. It's just that it can't be a major part of it. Um, and it's also going to be a big problem for the development and enjoyment of friendships or households and families and, and communities because anger tends to be very disruptive. Um, the last suggestion I have, too, about this, because we're, we're sort of drawing these Epicurean texts into territory they didn't go, he brings up the capacity for memory, as we talked about. Now, when we think about our, our capacity to get angry, memory sometimes plays into that, right? You ever have a fight with a close friend or a spouse, and now all the baggage from like the last year starts getting put onto the table? That's because <laughs> we remember things, you know? And you did this then, and what you're doing right now is just another example of 
how you, you know, view me, how you treat me, how you... Perceive yourself. Exactly, yeah. You perceive yourself that way. Yeah. So Epicurus would say, do we focus on remembering past pleasures? That's a good thing, to remember past pleasures, because that's pleasant, right? Or do we focus on remembering past pains, like when people screwed us over, or made us feel humiliated, or treated us unfairly? Um, If we're practicing an Epicurean life, um, we're probably going to develop a kind of forgetfulness towards the pains that we've encountered in the past. In part because usually we can't do anything about it, right? The people who made us angry, they're not in positions where we can get to them and do something about it. So if we just dwell on it, we're we're allowing them to hurt us again. And pain is a bad thing for these these hedonists. so let's, let's go on to Cicero. There's not much to say, actually, about him. Um, the De Finibus, or the, On the Ends, um, <coughs> there's some discussion there that gives us a little bit more detail about Epicurean moral theory, um, the virtues, wisdom, uh, and temperance. These would help us to distinguish between necessary and unnecessary desires. Um, they, would, they, would give, they would have some role in helping us not to be as angry as, as a result. If we're, if we're temperate, um, if we have control over our, our, our desires for bodily pleasures, um, like food or drink or, or sex, or, you know, laying around all day, you know, probably uh, you know, watching TV or Netflix or things like that would be under temperance these days. Um, we're probably going to be less angry if we're temperate because we're not tying ourselves in with things that make us vulnerable to being disappointed, you know. Um, he also says, one who is perpetually swayed by conflicting and incompatible counsels and desires can know no peace or calm. And remember, that's the goal for the Epicureans. Um, there's a discussion of mental diseases, which includes extravagant and imaginary desires. And among the examples picked out are the ill-tempered people, the, in Latin, the difficiles, the people who are kind of a pain in the ass, you know. They're always sour, they've always got something to be upset about, you know. Now, Lucretius has more to say. In the, on the nature of things. To begin with, Epicurus is, is cast over and over again as a savior figure um, who's released human beings from having to live in fear. Um, uh, one example uh, of this is he's, you know, he thinks that fire and water are these basic principles. They, they had this you know, four-element view. They were atomists, but they thought there were you know, things ultimately reduced to the four elements. Um, he thinks that fire and water are in strife with each other and at times overcome each other and the world. So the, the ancient Greeks had the story of this guy, um, Phaethon, who was the son of Helios, the sun, right? And Phaethon wants to drive his dad's chariot, and his dad agrees to it. And, of course, you know, he's not a good driver, so he gets too close to the earth and starts burning stuff up, and then he goes too high in the heavens. So Zeus gets ticked off and kills him with a thunderbolt. And... Um, Lucretia says, that's a terrible story. You know, there's, there's a, a cosmic thing going on here between, you know, fire and, and water. Uh, sometimes the earth floods, sometimes it gets baked. It doesn't have anything to do with Zeus getting angry and throwing thunderbolts. That's just the sort of thing that's going to screw kids up if you tell them that, you know. Um, and so he says, here's what he says about that. Poor humanity to saddle the gods with such responsibilities and to throw in a vindictive temper. Um, and, and he says, you know, this is going to screw up your, your religion. If you picture the quiet ones in their untroubled pieces tossed on turbulent waves of anger, you will not approach their temples with a tranquil heart. You're going to go to the temple trying to, you know, make sure God doesn't get ticked off at you. You know, I think, you know, going back to like what you're talking about uh, contemporary culture, I think a lot of people go to church in part because um, they, they want to make sure they stay on God's good side or something. Yeah. These are very superstitious notions, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, now, his focus on anger tends to be in terms of, of physical theory. So he thinks that anger is like a, a, having too much fire in the system, too much hot stuff in the system. And so he says when we become angry, we boil over with anger from heat. He says that some animals have a lot of that in their composition. The prime example is the lion. That's why the lion is so ferocious, why it's so angry all the time. Um, some human beings are like that as well. They have, some people have more of that, that disposition. They're what we call choleric, right? Using the theory of the humors. 
Um, and he says this can be dealt with to some degree by education and training and culture, but you cannot entirely change that. Um, you can reduce it to very small lingering traces, but um, you can't eliminate it entirely. Um, so a, a person who's, who's got some anger problems, you know, if, if they, like if they became an Epicurean, they could, they could lessen it. They, they could deal with it, but they couldn't totally eliminate it. Um, now, when we get to Philodemus, like I said, we don't have this whole work, but it was called On Anger. So at least here we've got somebody who's actually looking directly at anger. Um, unfortunately, we lost the first half of it. Um, what we've got, there's two main parts to it. The first part is what we call a diatribe, um, which is a, a, a rhetorical speech against something. Uh, and in this case, it's against anger. And that was a common thing around the uh, 2nd century and 1st century BC to write these diatribes about all sorts of things, against too much salt, you know, against uh, Alexander, against anger. There were a couple other against angers or on angers out there where people are like, yeah, look at what angry people look like, you know. We see this a bit in Seneca's on anger, a diatribe like that. Um, the other part is what we call a dialectical examination of anger where he's canvassing different views and saying, I think they got this part right, but this part wrong. And it's happening in two interesting ways with Philodemus. So there's these other philosophical schools out there. And we looked at two of them just the last two times. Um, the, the Aristotelians, you know, think about it like Goldilocks, right? Some, some people are, like, the porridge is too hot, the porridge is too cold, just right. <clears throat> Here's the Epicurean view. The Aristotelians, with respect to anger, they value it too highly. They, they, they think that it's okay to be angry in a lot of situations where it's not. They, they identify it with manliness. They think that you need anger to defend yourself. Um, too hot. The Stoics say anger is always bad. As a matter of fact, it's one of the worst of the, the vices and passions. Get rid of all your anger. It's never reasonable to be angry. Clearly, too cold. Just right would be the Epicurean position, right in the middle, you know? Um, and, and so here's how he, th so there's that, right? And then the Epicureans were arguing amongst themselves about other things too. So he, he stakes out a position in relation to the other Epicureans as what he views as the orthodox Epicurean position. He gives us a definition of anger, which is kind of an interesting one. He calls it a kindling, swelling, irritation and indignation, together with a fierce desire to pursue and contend with the person if one can. Um, so that, there's a lot rolled in there, isn't there? But a lot of it's kind of metaphorical language, I think. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. He makes a distinction between what he calls natural anger and empty anger or, or vain anger. It's the same word that where Epicurus is talking about vain or, or false um, beliefs. The Greek word is kenos, which means empty or vain um, and uh, or groundless, right? So there's natural anger and then there's groundless anger. Natural anger will be felt by the wise person as well as other people too. But, but even if you're the, the Epicurean wise person, the one who's living the Epicurean life, you're going to feel natural anger. It arises as a response to injury or harm when it is perceived as being actually intentional. So if I bump into you um, and you get angry with me and, and you, you think it's not really my fault, that's not natural anger. That's, that's the other type. But if you see me, like, you know, you see me go up and like trip her and you get angry at that, at that injury that's, that's being done because you say, look, that guy meant to do it, that would be natural anger. So we're going to have some of that occurring in part because human beings are kind of jerks to each other, right? Um, and it focuses on, on punishment, in, which in Greek is colossus. Um, and punishment meant as something like a medicine, a bitter medicine. You're, you, you know, punishment, you're imposing pain to try to bring about a, a better result, right? Is this fellow famous, excuse me, yeah. that you're talking about? Yes. Okay, I... I, I... Now, he's construing this as being Epicurus's position. I see. You know. Oh, um, I see. So it's not Epicurus. It's the way he's defining natural and vain. Yeah, I mean, here, here's the thing. It, it could be that um, 
Epicurus might have had something in one of his texts that we've lost that this is coming from. And what he's really doing is he's taking uh, categories from Epicurus that every, everybody who was a good Epicurean would know, you know, like the natural desires or the empty desires, and he's applying them to, to the topic of anger. Um, it'd be really cool if we actually had all of those texts. Um, but then we might find that, you know, apparently he was, Epicurus is not a very good stylist. Um, we might find them kind of hard to read. But uh, let's talk about empty anger. So he uses two different words for this. He calls it um, orge, which is the Greek word for anger. Orge kene, meaning, meaning empty. Um, and he also calls this by the Greek term thumos. Thumos and orge are used often as synonyms, but he wants to make a distinction between them. Um, and so thumos is always bad. Thumos is always you know, anger that's, that's out of control. And he says, empty anger is felt by the, the foolish or the underdeveloped person, not by the sage, not by the, the person who's, who's developed. It arises as a response to injury or to injustice or to slighting, uh, and it involves some sort of assumption or perception on the person's part. So it doesn't have to be a response to something deliberate, you know. Again, I bump into you, you're like, who the hell are you to bump into me? That would be an example of, of uh, empty anger. You know, it's, you know, maybe it's based on the idea that nobody should ever bump into you. You know, the universe you know, should have a, a nice barrier around you respecting your personal space. Clearly a, a crazy idea, you know, because <laughs> um, that's, I don't know where anyone would get, get that idea. Um, now, empty anger, he says, focuses on, on revenge. Okay. As opposed to punishment, it focuses on revenge. And the Greek word that he uses for that is the one that Aristotle used for defining anger, timoresis, you know, a, a rectification, setting things right. And he says it could not only come from empty opinions and beliefs, but also a bad disposition. So, you know, if you're the kind of person who gets angry all the time, you have a tendency to allow bad or false beliefs to make you react to situations and perceive malice on the part of people yeah. that don't have it, you know. Um, you're probably not going to be a good person to, to have in, in uh, you know, customer service, if that's the case. <laughs> 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 or, 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 or the front of the house, you know, in, in restaurants, you know. But you got that sort of thing, you can wash the dishes, you can keep the books, but you probably don't need to be dealing with customers, you know. So, now, um, he thinks that empty anger is, is an evil in itself, uh, both in itself and because of the troubles that it brings. Um, and empty anger, he thinks, involves some kind of foolish pleasure, which is imagining and taking revenge. So, the, the stewing that we do, the ruminating, you know, he thinks that. Now, one of the, one of the great um, uh, scholars who's, who's done work on this, um, this person... Uh, Tsuna suggests that empty anger involves mistaken beliefs about being wronged or whether you're being wronged or not or about the intensity of the wrong experience that we overvalue. You know, somebody um, spills coffee on my, my nice shirt, right? Um, that's something that can be easily remedied. Just, you know, wash it and yeah. we've got additives that you can put in. It's not the end of the world. But people do react as if it's the end of the world, right? So that would be a good example of, of a mistaken belief at work. Um, they also get, get mistaken about the potential for pleasure and retaliation. People will think to themselves, boy, if I can just show that person, that's going to be so great. And then you get it. I, th I think a lot of us have gone through this experience. You get it, and it's, it's, it's really not that enjoyable. Sometimes you actually feel bad for the person after you've you know, hurt them in response, and you don't want to... You don't want to let on because then, you know, you'd have to apologize yourself and you've just made them, you know, the bad person. So, um, Philodemus views anger as both as actually getting angry and as the disposition. Um, so, because of these false beliefs, some people can get enraged about anything. There are some people who are just like, they're always getting angry. I, I think you probably know some people like that. Other people, he says, can get angry and stay angry for years. We've seen this sometimes in like, you know, family disputes, um, co-workers can, you know, be a problem that way. So what's really interesting is he, he not only discusses how anger happens and makes this distinction, 
he wants to provide some sort of treatment for anger. And he, um, he views it as a, something like a moral disease, but also as what we would nowadays call mental illness. You know, the Greeks didn't recognize a, a you know, strong distinction, as we often do in our culture, between those. They saw them as sort of a continuum. Um, and the treatment would be <clears throat> partly rational persuasion. You know, if you think about what cognitive behavior therapy, if any of you have ever used that, does to try to deal with anger management, you try to analyze your beliefs that are leading you to being angry and see whether they're rational or not. And hopefully if you can see that they're irrational, it makes you less angry or you don't act on the anger at least. Um, and partly he says it has to consist in this, this technique of setting before the eyes, um, which is using the imagination to, to create or, or evoke a repugnance and other aspects in relation to anger. So when we looked at the Stoics, we saw Seneca advocating um, having a person look in the mirror when they're angry. That's one way to bring you know, the angry visage before the eyes. There's other ways to do it as well. Look at somebody else who's angry and then realize that you probably look like that person. And then there's supposed to be some sort of, you know, some sort of um, app reactive, you know, uh, reaction to that, where you say, oh, I don't want to be like that. That's, that's not who I am. And that can help you to, to be less angry. Um, he argues that we ought to engage in treatment when a person is actually angry. And here he differed with some of the other Epicureans. Some of them said, look, once a person's lost their temper, there's nothing you can do. You know, forget it. And he says, no, this is actually the best time to do it because now you can start to reshape the, the perceptions and the habits and the ways that their, their, their psyche works. Um, another interesting feature is that Philodemus very explicitly criticizes anger that's being exhibited towards wives, towards children, and towards slaves. So he's very conscious of power dynamics in ancient society. Um, we can see that he's affirming the importance of the value of family and household relationships and the vulnerability of, of, um, uh, to anger's effects by those who are, are in a position to get angry. The, the male householder is the one who gets to be angry. The slave doesn't get to be angry because if they do, then they'll get, you know, uh, put down or something like that. He's also being very attentive to the vulnerability of all the people who are in the one-down position, the women, the children, and the slaves. Um, and he's, he's very clear about this. He, he, he would say, um, if you're an Epicurean, you cannot be taking anger out on people who are vulnerable to you, like you know, maybe employees, right? You can kick your employees around, or one way people often... Uh, vent their angers, they go out to a restaurant, then they treat the waiter or the waitress like, like crap, you know, or other customer service people. Um, he would say that's, that's something you really have to watch. Um, he also thinks that anger can be a major impediment to education. And so I have a few other remarks. Let me, uh, since we have a little bit of time, I'll, I'll tell you about another work that he, he has called On Frank Criticism. Uh, or the Greek word for that is parasia, freedom of speech, is sometimes translated as. And if you're, if you're trying to tell people that the way that they're living is not 100% correct, and they need to change some of it, and <laughs> some of that's rooted in the way that they typically react to things, sooner or later you've, you've actually got to you know, tell people, hey, you're screwing up. This is, this is not the way you should be behaving. So... Now, of course, that doesn't guarantee they'll listen to you, right? uh, as we all know from having been on both sides of that, I think. Um, but sometimes you actually have to, as we say, call a spade a spade. And you have to say to somebody, look, the way you're behaving, uh, it's, it's, it's actually bad. It's bad for you. It's bad for the other people. That's what, what he's calling parasia. Like intervention. Yeah, an intervention would have to include that. It couldn't be a very effective intervention if you just skated around. You, know? you never actually got to the point of saying, can you imagine, a, this is sort of a digression, but imagine an intervention, like the person comes in and everybody's sitting there and there's some cookies and some coffee and they're like, well, it's nice that you all came over. You know, what, what's going on? Well, we wanted to talk to you about some stuff. You know, there's, there's a few things that are making us uncomfortable these days. Oh, really? What are those? 
I don't really want to burden you with them. You know, um, let's uh, let's talk about how your life is going. And they never, then you know, after an hour or so, they're they're like, well, this was a nice chat. <laughs> that wouldn't be a very good intervention. Would it? Well, so so you know, that's actually a good way to put it. Those intervention, the the Epicurean practitioner is kind of intervening in the, the student's life. Um, so Philodemus rejects what he calls harshness in, in um, this intervention or exhortation when rather frankness is being called for. So he's, so he's distinguishing between, you know, you can, you can tell people the same content and do it in a way that's um, what we call assertive as opposed to aggressive or overly hostile or confrontational or you know, in ways that are just putting people down, you know, you can say, look, buddy, you've got anger problems and you need to work on it. Or you can say, wow, you're just a complete jerk. And so one would be um, frankness and the other one would be harshness. That's showing sensitivity. Yeah. And some people don't have that, you know. Honesty, um, honesty without compassion. I thought that was a good saying. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, yes. would, that would fit in with this. Yeah. Yes. Um, there is a kind of brutality, a kind of um, reduction to our animal nature in, in harshness, uh, the Epicureans would say. He also criticizes the, the, you know, where it's starting to skate too close to the edge. He says that young people have a tendency to start out with frankness and then it easily shifts into um, a kind of abusive uh, harshness. And he says some people can't distinguish between these in, in two different ways. They can't tell when they're doing it so they're the person who says, oh, I'm just being honest with everybody. And then you're like, no, you're a jerk. You, you talk to people in terrible ways. You know, here's how you could say it instead, like, you know, with some compassion, for example, right? Uh, or some empathy. Um, and then other people can't distinguish it um, when other people are, are criticizing them. They can't distinguish between frankness, telling people what they need to hear, and just, you know, coming down hard on them. And so any time you criticize them, they get, they get upset or angry. Now, he says that some teachers, or sorry, some students can't take frank speech by um, their teachers or fellow students. And these include people who have anger problems. Um, this is something I've seen on both sides. Again, we were talking about this. Uh, when I was um, uh, a student, I actually did quite a few of the things that I now find to be kind of a pain in the butt that students do in my classes, and so I have to be a little bit more receptive to them doing that and forgiving because I did these things. Um, and one of them is, is taking offense too easily. Um, and some students are, are like that. You know, you give them, you know, you give them a C on their paper because their paper wasn't very good, you know, and it didn't fulfill the criteria that would be required for a B or an A, and then they get mad. Because, you know, they, they don't want to hear that their, their paper um, wasn't what they thought it was, you know. Um, I remember actually in just feeling enraged. Um, when I was a graduate student, I had to take these, these uh, uh, various tests. At the master's level, you had one test and then four at the, the Ph.D. level. And it was, the master's was called the COMPS, the Comprehensive. And you had to write about, you know, ancient philosophy, medieval philosophy, modern philosophy in 19th century. And you get like a list of questions, and you would pick one from, from each of those. And I got a low pass. And I thought I'd done so great on it. <laughs> and, and some of the criteria, they would, let, they would show you the greatest remarks. So like some of them were actually, quite frankly, you know, not, not very well grounded. You know, like one person was upset because my first uh, sentence when it, this, this discussion about Plato was 16 lines long, so too long for a sentence. It was, you know, well constructed. <laughs> now, you know, on the, on the other hand, perhaps that is too long. Perhaps that's, that's too unwieldy. Not everybody wants to be reading Cicero when they're grading a test. And I'm very attentive to that now as a teacher grading other people's stuff. Now, I want things to be fairly straightforward. You know, I don't want a, a display of eloquence. You know, I want to see that the student knows their thing. <laughs> Um, but I remember just being, you know, for days, I was just irate about that. But that's because I have anger problems, you know. Other students would get that and it would just roll off their back. When I came to the prelims, I ended up with uh, uh, three high passes and a pass because I, I did things differently. And um, by then I'd, I'd gotten some of that 
dealt with. He also talks about the, the, um, the teacher cannot afford to be angrily disposed towards students. In part, it sets a bad example. If, if the Epicurean way of life is supposed to actually make you into a calmer, happier person, and you're losing your temper with your students, clearly it's not working. So you why the hell should they do it? You, know? you always have to give a person, like, to save, save face, like the Japanese. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But there has to be some mm -hmm. way of letting, letting the anger sort of melt away, in a way, by saving face, That's not right. pinpointing what their errors are and everything like that, not humiliating anyone. They have that's, to have that's a way, the way to out. Yeah. Yeah. They have to have a way out. There's a, there's a technique that's used these days um, called sandwiching. Uh, and it's becoming so prevalent that now it doesn't really work very well, because people <laughs> see it coming. <laughs> and it's, if you're going to criticize somebody, um, you got the criticism in the middle. That's the meat, and then you got something nice that you say at the beginning, and something that you nice, something nice that you say at the end. Right? And so there's a sandwich there. Like Seinfeld said, it's not you, it's me. Yeah, that's another way to do it too. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, in some cases, I mean, you're right. You don't want to, you don't want to unduly humiliate people. Some people will be humiliated in cases where they probably shouldn't because they, they take things too, too sensitively. And, and so there's a, there's a balance here. You, you know, if you want people's lives to improve, you got to be open and honest with them, but you don't have to be a jerk about it. You know? um, he also says that the wise person can get angry and will even sometimes punish people, but whenever they're punishing somebody, they're not going to take enjoyment in it like most other people do. You know, most other people are, are saying, now I've got you, you SOB. You know? <laughs> the wise person is not going to do that. They're going to feel bad in, mm -hmm. in punishing. Um, and he, he compares it to drinking wormwood or absinthe, you know, which is supposed to be very bitter. He uses the medicine back at that time or surgery. Surgery back then was not what surgery is now. <laughs> yeah. uh, surgery was a last resort. You know, it wasn't something that could possibly be in you know outpatient. You know, there was no outpatient surgery at that time. So you know, he's comparing anger to, to that. Um, he also says that the errors of the other person should be taken up in, in sympathy. You know, that you can you can say, like you were saying, you know, I, I could say to some of these students, which I don't usually do. I've been where you are. I, I do that with some students. Um, I, I understand what you're going through. You know, that's, that's showing sympathy or like you're talking about compassion. Um, the opposite of that would be um, either harshness or the other thing he talks about, ridicule. Oh, you're so stupid. You know, that, that's a, a mean thing to do to students, right? And it's not going to work. Um, so he, he says that anger is, uh, you know, natural to human beings, and it's going to have to be dealt with at certain times. There are some cases where we should get angry, um, where that's the, the right thing for us to do. It's always, you know, to some degree, a reflection of our, our vulnerability to each other, but there's lots of ways in which anger can go wrong. So it, it is really a middle position between the Aristotelians, who aren't glorifying anger, but our, they do have a lot more scope for legitimate anger, and the Stoics are saying, never, never, ever, ever get angry. Um, and that's, that's, what, that's what we've got for the Epicurean position. Um, it's too bad we don't have the rest of his, his text on anger. I, wish, I really wish we did, because uh, there might be some really interesting stuff in there. But, um, so now let's, let, you know, we have some time for... Um, open questions or yeah, comments? Or. Um, about the idea that death kind of negates a focus on the future. Okay. Um, what about a f the focus on the past? In other words, if you're uh, continually thinking about um, the um, like maybe looking back to uh, your great ancestors or something like yeah. that and, and giving yourself... Uh, Airs, that kind of that? Uh, yeah, or just pleasure from the fact that you're an important person. But, I mean, really, the, a, a, big, a big past. I'm not just talking about feeling good about yesterday. But, yeah. Uh, and making that a big part of your life. What, uh, how does that relate to the not looking ahead? Well, I mean, Epicurus would probably see that kind of pleasure 
and desire as one that's likely to lead to problems unless you're doing it in such a way that it's not like depending on other people in some way treating you, you know, according to what your ancestry you think deserves or stuff like that. Does it lead to some kind of arrogance? It could, and if it does, then that's liable to make you feel pain as a result when other people don't treat you like you're somebody special, you know. But if you, but if you were just like on your own and you spent time thinking about pleasant topics like your illustrious ancestors and how, how cool they were and, and, and you didn't like it didn't cause you any trouble I think you would be okay with that you know I think it's, very, it's pretty rare though that people do that did they, but there, was there much like focus on history or was it more of a living in the moment um I wouldn't say it was really either. Living in the moment would be what, like, the hedonists who really focus on the body would, would advocate, you know. Um, Epicurus is interested in the space of the life. He didn't seem particularly interested in, in you know, like the grand sweep of history because you're going to die pretty soon, relatively speaking, to the grand sweep of history, and it's not going to matter that much to you. Um, uh, what about your contribution, in other words? Like a legacy? The, the, you, yes, or even the concept of you know planting an acorn so your yeah. children have an oak tree. That's, like I pointed out, that's, that's where some of the people were saying, you seem to be a little inconsistent, Epicurus. I mean, you've got this last will and testament that you know provides for all these people who are supposed to be taken care of, which slaves are supposed to be freed, who's going to do what in the garden, you know, mm-hmm. What do you care? You're going to be dead. You know? um, so I don't know. I, I don't have a good answer for that. There, I think there is an inconsistency there. Well, I don't... I don't go ahead. I just wanted to finish answering. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, go ahead. I, I, no, I, yeah. I, that, that, the fact about planting a tree or you want to leave something, even if you feel there's nothing out there, you know, once you're gone, you're gone. You're just out in the universe. It's, it's a process that helps human beings mm-hmm. or any animals because even elephants go go and, and visit their, their dead but it's a process that like when I think of those things or I'm preparing my gravestone or whatever I say to myself well I don't know if it's going to be there if anybody's going to do what I want it's just that yeah. I feel that I've prepared it and if it's not there there could be an earthquake everything goes down right I mean, yeah. even with some of those floods, they found a coffin flowing somewhere out in one of the states. You yeah. know? So it just makes that ending. I understand that. that. I'm asking him about in relation to the Epicureans and how they think. That was my question. There is one question. passage yeah. in the Vatican sayings where he says something along the lines of, um, you know, you should try to leave things better than you found them. Mm-hmm. You know? Oh. Um, and I suppose you could say that if you're doing that, you're receiving a kind of pleasure about, and it's a mental pleasure about thinking how you've you know made things better. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess you know leaving leaving things in good order. I mean, Epicurus did did do a last will and testament, and he he seemed to have cared about how the garden, which is his legacy. It was going to continue. He even like you know provided for them to celebrate his birthday, which you know. Did he have children? Did you say no? He didn't. He didn't have um, a family, a son. No, the, the the people in the garden were like his family. No. You know, friendship for Epicureans was was held in such high um, respect. It's, it's really seen as as he says, um, prudence or, or, or practical mm-hmm. wisdom is a mortal good. Friendship is an immortal good. So there you've got somebody who's, who's, who thinks that we're all mortal and who thinks we're all going to die sooner or later, but he says that friendship is an immortal good. I don't really know what to make of that myself. So I think that's his answer. That's to I'm people sure. who say you're being, what is it, you said you're, you're, there's a discrepancy. I don't think that's a discrepancy because he's talking about if friendship is an immortal good, yeah. then that's what he's doing. He's, he's leaving that 
you know, but for them to take on. Here's why it seems kind of strange to say that. So the, in a friendship, the components of the friendship are the friends. Every one of them is mortal, all right? So how can the friendship be immortal when the people who compose the friendship are all... all are but all we're going. all going to the same place. We're going out into the universe. Yeah, but so there's no we. We're for the Epicureans, there's no we after we die, you know? I mean, our, our atoms are being uh, scattered into the universe. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's no, like, you know, Greg Sadler that's going to continue on in the universe. Maybe, you know, virtually in YouTube. Okay. <laughs> well, bits of you, yeah. Well, we don't know yeah. that. But we don't know either. Yeah, Marvin. Well, it, 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 I think consistent <laughs> with what you've expressed about Epicurean beliefs, if you um, do something that will help people after you are dead, you are providing for yourself some anticipation of uh, things that will make you have pleasure while you're still living. Yeah. If I know that right. if I leave a million dollars to you, it will make you happier, I feel good about the thought of it. Oh, I will. <laughs> Maybe I won't. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I think a, a lot of what you described as Epicurean beliefs are, um, could be interpreted as rationalized principles of morality. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's it, it really places a strong emphasis on prudence. Yeah, you know, yeah. you can't be a good ep- Epicurean without living in a, in a prudent way. Um, but I like Carpe Diem, you know. Yeah. Like hay while the sun shines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My uh, point. What, what? This is a bizarre kind of thinking. Okay. You see, what's happening today with all the aggression like ISIS and all these young people re- being recruited, all this hatred coming yeah. out and everything, and then in literature, we get someone like Patterson who throws out that the animals are going to take over. Okay. Then, this is a weird kind of explanation of resolving the anger in the world. Are the animals going to be any better than the humans? Oh, I, I don't know the... the... The Patterson. No, he work. writes the. He writes all these crazy books on <laughs> on, uh, on murder. Alex Patterson. Okay. Yeah. I think I've seen his name. He's now throwing out the animals that are going to take over. Yeah. And I'm saying, yeah, there is a lot of hatred in this world. There's a lot of ways in which the world is going direction. They're recruiting young people. What's going to happen in this world? Well. The animals have gotten angry at the humans, and so they're going to take over. And then I go bizarre in this, and I say, now the animals going to be any better than the humans? Or are they going to fight within themselves? Well, I mean, we have a few... Um, That's a new direction. We have a few literary things like that. I mean, think about Orwell's Animal Farm. All the animals are equal, except some are more equal, you know, sooner or later. But it's because they behave like human beings, and by the end... The pigs are almost human beings. They're walking well, into legs. Well, I, 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 I could yeah, see it. I mean, they just recently took yeah. a video of, um, I forget what country it was, but this the elephant, the elephant was passing the road, and there was cars on each side, and the baby elephant just decided it didn't want to walk, so it, like, lay down. And they were amazed. Everybody stopped in their cars, and they took the video, and... The other elephants were coming, and they were pushing on the baby elephant to get up. And you watch this whole process yeah. of helping the mother with her elephant. I don't know if we're that good. And they got this baby elephant up, and they passed. They passed by, and it was just wonderful. I watched it on video. Yeah, it was really. really interrupt. Is there a Marvin in here? Yes. Yeah. Your wife is on the phone. She said it's an emergency. Oh. Um. Oh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I don't know what you think. I mean, uh, a lot of the uh, philosophy is sort of negated by uh, science and, uh, you know, some of the advances that we made. Yeah. After all, it was to try to, it was to acquire knowledge about stuff that we don't know. Yeah. About. But... It's interesting about anger because psychiatry and psychology uh, 
it's not what she read, really. It's, yeah. It's quite, uh, it's still relevant today, and it's still, uh, 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 I mean, I have a degree in psychology, and, and it's not I mean, the, 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 the ancient philosophers <laughs> were really good observers of human behavior. Their physical theories, yeah, I mean, totally, you know, can't get anything out of those now, right? Anger is not a boiling of blood near the heart. Or no. the air, so <laughs> you know, too much hot stuff in our system, you know? But yeah, I mean, they, I think myself that if we put together um, Plato, and we're going to look at Plutarch next time um, as a Platonist, Aristotle, the Stoics, Epicurus, and a few other later thinkers like Thomas Aquinas, we have insights into the workings of the emotions, rationality, and particularly anger that much of the, the psychological theory can't even come close to. They've, they've, so, they've treated anger so reductively. Um, even people that, you know, that are very interesting, like Freud, ang anger ends up just being aggression. You know, and how do we conceptualize that? So by going back to these ancient philosophers, we at least get models, I think, that, that are useful for thinking about how we, we might, you know, get ourselves back on track and understand why we get in fights with people. And, well, we have to start really looking at, you know, there, there's a lot that they're discovering with the science of the brain. Sure. Well, and yes, yes the and physical, no. Yes and no. I mean, they're, I mean they're, they're, they still have a long way to go. We know nothing about humans, actually, the way we, why we think the way we But they're looking at the, what is it, the hypothalamus? And yeah, but that's just like big people, global stuff. Yeah. No, no, but they're saying that people who have empathy, where in the brain it is associated, that some some people have a, a bigger hypothalamus who have yeah, more Yeah, I mean, that sort of idea than, I mean, they're finding centuries. a lot of, of... Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And so when we physically studies, have these different... The way those studies are reported is usually like, this is the way it is. The way the studies are actually, you know, documented by the people carrying them out is, yeah, we've noticed this correlation, and it might be this way. And the, I mean, this, the the actual science is very hazy. But the thing the, is, the reporting on it is the where it's like, yeah, we're making definite progress. And I'm, I'm not saying that's done deal. Yeah, I'm just saying that it. It could very well, I mean, because we are not all the same. Sure. Not just because of, you know, I mean, there are reasons we, we behave differently, not just because of our, our environment, but because of our, you know, I believe in nature and nurture. And so we can't just have one specific list of how we do things. One of the things that you're going to find in all these philosophical things is there's nature, there's nurture, and what science always leaves out because it's much diff much more difficult to conceptualize and manage, our choice, human freedom, mm -hmm. and what we do with nurture and nature. And we do have the freedom if we take on something like this. Am I going to be an angry person or am I going to work on my anger? Mm -hmm. That's not totally dictated by my genetics. That's not totally dictated by my environment. At what, some point, I have to make that my own project. And can. science cannot quantify that in any way. <laughs> science is unable to explain where that decision actually takes place. They can tell you all sorts of stuff about the about the, na the nurture and the nature, but they can't get at that distinction. But there's still the controversy on free will. There, there, there is. Well, there's still a controversy there, whether we completely have free here's, will. Yeah, but the, the, here's here's the things to say about that. First, the people involved in the controversy don't even agree about what what counts as free will. So a lot of times they're talking past each other. Second, um, it doesn't matter that there's a controversy because when we're, if we're doing science, right, then we need to have consensus across the board, replicability and stuff like that. If we're doing philosophy, that's not demanding. So we don't need to have everybody convinced, even you know, people who want to say, no, there's no free will. We don't have to have them convinced in order for us to say, look, I observe free will, you know. I don't care myself what Sam Harris thinks. But Sartre believed that, well, if you Sartre believed in free will. Yeah, he said, he said yeah. that if you if you said, okay, go to war or you get killed, 
Well, that's your choice. Then get killed if you don't want to go to war. I don't consider that very <laughs> much. Well, that, free will. that is free will. Um, oh, that's then, then it, that's a that's a classic issue that's been dealt with by Aristotle, by Anselm. You're 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 making you're sort of blurring two things together. Yeah. There's the the freedom of choice which exists, and then there's like the freedom to define your entire situation. Those are not the same thing. But you have a natural. All human beings, all animals, have a natural. Yeah, dis, dis, can, for survival. Yeah, and we can so choose, if you want to survive, and we can choose to go against and, it because and, we have free will. I don't. And people I don't, do do that. I don't agree yeah. That. Um, the emphasis on the, of, of the Epicureans, to me, maybe a little more than some of the other philosophers mm -hmm. we've talked about, seems to be that you. This is a practice. And you practice it, and so you go back to the practice mm -hmm. as your life goes. Well, that that's right? that's there in the Aristotelians too, mm -hmm. and that's there in the Stoics. They all saw philosophy as a way of life. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you want to, if you want to quit being as angry, I'm not going to say quit being angry, right? Because <laughs> we're probably always going to be angry. But you want to have better control of your anger. They all think that you have, you got to do something. Mm -hmm. Uh, over and over again in order to change it. They don't always agree on how far it's supposed to go or what techniques you would use. But even the Epicureans didn't, you know, like with Philodemus, some of the Epicureans were saying, um, look, it doesn't do any good to try to intervene when a person is angry, and Philodemus is saying that's the best time to do it, uh -huh. you know. Um, interestingly, on that, Philodemus would be lined up with the Aristotelians and the other Epicureans would be lined up more with the Stoics, who, who tended to think that, look, once, once you've given in to anger, too late, it's, it's, it's off and running and doing what it does, and maybe you can clean up after, after you, you know, got your, your brain back, you know? Um, so, yeah, I mean, they all have an emphasis on practice. It'll be the same thing with Plutarch when we look at him next time. He's giving advice about what to do with your anger. How to how to how to be less angry from a platonic perspective? Um, yeah, go ahead. What, what's what I've been pondering? I, can't, I I was very struck in the discussion that we had after your last talk. All about the stars. Yes, yeah. and the thing about it, um, I found myself very much feeling like a stoic, although I found in the group. People really want to tell everybody else exactly what to do and think. And I don't, and yeah, that's pretty common. Yeah. You know, well, <laughs> yeah. but I felt at the time that um, it's not necessarily wrong to keep your own comfort. And I'm struck with our discussion here um, uh, today that we are not involved in a discussion of how we fix the whole rest of the world or tell our best friend what they're doing wrong nearly as much as we were last week, last month with the Stoics. Yeah. Do you know what I, I mean, I, the I Stoics know. themselves didn't worry about fixing the whole world because they thought that the whole world was going to more or less stay screwed up and they could like, control <laughs> yeah. this little bit, you know. Uh, I don't know, maybe we got it out of our you system. You can only control time. your own world, <laughs> yeah. your own little space. Little local. Your, your own little yeah. space. You live it the way you, whether you want to be a stoic or a stoic. Yeah, yeah. Or, or whatever. Well, I haven't been part of some of these prior discussions, I'm sorry to say, but it strikes me just from uh, you know, this last hour, it strikes me that the ancient philosophers really uh, had it pretty easy because they didn't have to confront questions, uh, for instance, uh, about global warming, about the great ethical issues that we're facing now. They the world was a, a finite, an infinite place to them that yeah. human numbers could expand. Uh, species weren't vanishing, the earth wasn't, the environmental systems weren't collapsing. So I find that, you know, from the standpoint of not just anger, but just in, yeah. in general, the, the ancient philosophers were had it pretty easy. You know, that's sort of my impression. I wouldn't uh, say I easy, struggle. because they're, <laughs> cause most of the problems of the human condition are present then. We have some new problems, certainly, but, um, I mean, they were dealing with uh, some things that, that we don't find to be quite as big of a problem, like the fact that um, when you went to war, most of the casualties were due to infection and disease, and wars were constantly happening then. And, you know, I mean, I think there's there's a trade-off there. And, and the other thing we could think about is, 
do they, you know, you're right. They, they, they weren't really thinking about environmental concerns or stuff like that. Could they think about that today using their, their, their framework? Um, some of them, yes, and I think some of them, no. You know, um, that would be one of those things where you want to look at what the people who identify themselves with these particular schools today, what they have to say about it. Like, I know the Neo-Stoics, um, they talk about environmental concerns, but they're, they're, they're not just using, you know, the text that they have. they got to do some extrapolation. And, um, I don't know about Epicureans, and because I don't know many Neo-Epicureans, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, on anger, I mean, it's, it's interesting, I mean, the uh, detail. Uh, uh, he specifically points out uh, it's not good to be angry with the, uh, the slaves, the uh, children. The, yeah, for the dangerous yeah. And I like when you, if you travel through the world today, particularly the, the Middle East, uh, yeah. quite, quite a bit uh, uh, there, it, it's amazing the level of abuse, the, the, uh, yeah. how males uh, dominate the, uh, mm. uh, the society and the ranking. Uh, so it's very germane in today's world. I mean, uh, yeah, uh, yes, you're right. it's 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 horrible. I mean, uh, well, I, I I'm not very young, but my first job was working on Wall Street doing investment research. Believe me, that is talk about power and yeah. uh, press, oh yeah. everything. Yeah. It, it's seared my soul. <laughs> yeah, I think anytime there's a power differential. Yeah. Some people are going to be more vulnerable. So Philodemus would, you know, they didn't, they didn't have any sort of conception of like race back then, right? right. But um, if, if Philodemus were here in our society, race would be an issue for him. Uh -huh. Well, slavery yes. might have been a little bit comparable. Yeah. To but, you know, class. I, yeah, and, and you know, in, in our society, it was rather unique in that slavery was effectively based on, on race. We actually shifted from a something very much like slavery, indentured servitude, which had no racial connections, to um, racial-based slavery. Um, and then, you know, had to deal with, we're still dealing with the legacy of that. Um, but, you know, yeah, the, any sort of power differential, Philodemus would say there's a vulnerability there where the people who are on top get to be angry, and it's very easy for them to, like, be abusive. And then the people on the bottom have to suck it up you know, they don't get to be angry, even though they have more cause to be angry. They're conditioned to me. But yeah. Really and but, really, yeah. if you ignore that kind of thing in in, in any age, in any yeah. era, you, you big problems just just fester. Yeah. And that's yeah. what we're seeing. Yeah. That's really what we're seeing. It, it, it was it was going to happen sooner or later. And it, and it could happen even here in the United yeah. States we're seeing it.